Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started tonight. Um, first off, I want to thank everyone for taking time tonight and getting on. Uh, this is the Northwest District Fisheries Informational Meeting. We've had a statewide meeting. We've had the meeting for the Southeast District, the Northeast, and now the Northwest. And we'll have tomorrow night that the Southwest District. I uh, want to thank everybody again. Uh, thanks to uh, some of the wildlife guys that I see are on. Uh, I think we probably have some law enforcement guys on. Uh, I saw some parks guys on. So we've got pretty good representation across some of the districts. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, so as we answer, ask questions or have questions and stuff at the end, if we need to, we can call on them. Uh, I'm going to explain a little bit about the meeting tonight as far as our, our agenda. Uh, first, we'll go through some introductions. We've got fishery staff from across the state uh, online here tonight. So regardless of the district uh, boundaries and stuff, we should have experts from across the state to help out on answering questions. I'll go over a little bit over some Zoom protocols. Uh, then I'll turn it over and Tony Berta will cover the fisheries division overview and then the district guys are going to take it from there. And again, most important is that question and answer period at the end. Uh, a little bit on the Zoom. Uh, we ask that everybody mute themselves, but make sure that little red cross is across the little microphone in the lower left hand corner. Also to shut down the video while we're doing the presentations that helps with some of the bandwidth makes it move a little smoother. And then this is the chat button. And we ask that when you enter stuff in the chat, if you have a comment, put comment first. If it's a question, put question. As Jordan, Jordan Cott is gonna be going through and monitoring those and it just makes it a little easier for him to spot them and pull them out to ask the questions at the end there. There's also a reaction button that you can use uh, down there that well, you, you raise your hand to kind of help if you have trouble with anything. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tony. Thanks, Dean. Um, I'm going to go over just our, like Dean mentioned, our, our basic uh, uh, structure of our fisheries division, which starts out with uh, um, letting, letting everybody know how we're funded as a division, how we do our projects and, and, and conduct the activities that we do. Um, we, are, we are primarily a, a user fee-based uh, system. Um, we we rely on fishing license sales in addition to sport fish restoration program dollars, federal dollars that come in through excise taxes on fishing tackle um, and equipment, uh, um, boats and, and um, taxes on uh, motorboat fuel. We also rely on aquatic invasive species fees. You'll hear about some aquatic invasive species issues throughout or within this presentation. And uh, it's an important component of our funding mechanism to, to help fight the spread of that. And that's through, we, we gain that, that funding through our res, resident voter registration fees, a portion of that, as well as non-resident uh, voter stickers that are required. And then in addition to those base funds, we rely on many public and private partnerships and collaborations and other grant opportunities to increase capacity uh, for, for a lot of our programs. So our fisheries division structure, uh, we've, we have three main sections within our fisheries division. Our management section is made up of four, uh, four districts that are uh, spaced throughout the state. And you'll be hearing from the Northwest guys uh, tonight. Um, and, and within the fisheries management, we do a lot of fish population surveys where we monitor fish populations and implement uh, different management techniques based on what we're seeing in our fish population and habitat assessments. 
Um, speaking of habitat assessments within our management section, our aquatic habitat program is housed. Um, this is a nationally recognized program. It has been uh, in existence since 1997. Um, and we've relied on funding from this aquatic habitat stamp that's part of your fishing license to, um, to fund different projects and, and many times large projects to uh, enhance habitat in our lakes, rivers, uh, streams, and reservoirs. In addition to uh, the aquatic habitat program, we also have angler access. Um, an angler access program and a boating access enhancement program. Um, uh, we, we do a lot of uh, different um, enhancement projects using federal funds and internal, uh, internal state funds to provide better access to a lot of our uh, public fishing waters. We also have a private water section um, or a private waters program within our management section that uh, um, Jeff Blauser provides a lot of technical expertise uh, to private land or private pond and lake, lake owners for, for fisheries management. And then last but not least within our management section, we have an AIS uh, program. Like I mentioned before, we have, a, we have a funding mechanism that helps pay for uh, programs and activities related to aquatic invasive species. Our production section uh, is our, our hatchery, hatchery system. We have five hatcheries throughout the state. Um, and each of these hatcheries uh, propagate, raise, and distribute a number of different fish species, uh, depending on uh, what, what best suits each of their systems in each of these facilities. Um, we, we do a lot of different types of fish culture and one of the things that we put a lot of resources in here recently are, are some advanced or larger fish, uh, extensive culture growing out large fish like this, this advanced fingerling walleye. Another thing that we, we do, and it's very timely for, for this presentation since we're right in the first part of March is uh, uh, seasonal trout stockings. And we have trout stockings that will be coming up uh, very quick within Within the next week, we're going to start a lot of our trout stockings to uh, uh, many areas of the state. So be looking for news releases on, on, on fish stockings near you. And then our research section. Within our research section, we have our rivers and streams program where we, uh, where we investigate and conduct projects on both cool water and warm water rivers and streams. Our Missouri River program uh, focuses a lot on our uh, native fish community, including the federally endangered pallet sturgeon, as well as some sport fish like our paddlefish and uh, channel catfish and flathead catfish fisheries. And then we also have individuals within our, within our uh, agency that work very closely with uh, different universities as we collaborate and contract out different research projects to conduct applied research where the results of those, those research projects uh, help us really guide management of our fisheries. We also have a couple of other important components of our fisheries division, and that's our education, uh, our aquatic education program. Larry Pape is a one man show. However, he relies heavily on volunteers to help out with a lot of the programs that he does to educate not only youth but also adults uh, with with fishing and aquatic education related related activities and we really really appreciate a lot of the time and the effort these these folks put into uh, to helping out with these with these projects we couldn't do it do it without you and then Daryl Bauer leads our outreach for for the division um, conducting a lot of different activities to get information out to you, the anglers, whether that is through his blog, barbs and backlashes, through social media, um, as well as uh, putting out an annual fishing forecast and, and uh, fishing guide. And I may mention that uh, folks 
should check out the new fishing guide every year. You should check check it out um, and and see what's changed from year to year, new regulations and that sort of thing. But we do have a quite a bit different format this year in a number of instances with different tables for fish species regulations as well as a different uh, a public water section. So uh, check that out when you get a chance and familiarize yourself with it. So you so you know where to look when you're out on the water. And in addition, just to uh, our own division, we we couldn't do a lot of things that we do without without the other divisions within our agency, our our parks, our wildlife, our law enforcement, and all the divisions that make up our agency really uh, help us out and help us fulfill our mission uh, here with the fisheries division. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Al and uh, the Northwest District guys to uh, tell you more specifically about the projects going on in their area. Hey, thanks, Tony. Yeah, we're gonna kind of run through this tonight. Um, this slide's a little bit busy, but our other guys here, uh, Joe Rydell and Zach Brashears are gonna talk after me. We kind of split this up between all of us, so. Anyway, we'll start with our aquatic habitat pro program projects. This is just an overview of the state since 1997 till now. This is awful busy, so we'll kind of put a plug in here. Like Tony was saying, in 1997, we started an aquatic habitat stamp that allowed us to leverage money against habitat projects that's earmarked. And this is something I'll put a plug in for our old uh, chief of fisheries. He went all around the state and got this started. And we go to other states and other meetings, and they are very envious of what we got going in this state. So just kind of a plug for where we were a long time ago. Currently, we've got some active projects out here and some that oh, are in the near future, we hope. But sometimes it takes a couple, three years to get these started and get on the ground. So. Right now we're doing a lot with uh, streams. We kind of had a, a partnership with a, a Preby down the valley where we could uh, partner some uh, aquatic habitat money with an NET grant and get something done. I'll talk a little more on that later, but that's uh, out here in the Panhandle Dry Spotted Tail Creek. We got stream project going on South Belly Creek. Uh, Bordeaux Creek, we got one actively going. Smith Lake is our next one in the uh, future for doing our WMA uh, habitat and enhancement, maybe for angler access and getting rid of some uh, vegetation. We'll talk about dry spotted tail creek. Most of this will be about streams that I'm, I'm gonna deal with, but now in the Scottsbluff Valley in the North Platte Valley, uh, which all the streams on the north side of the river, are typically cold, cold water trout supporting streams. And over the years, as you can see right here in the photo on the left, they just pretty much just channelized them a straight shot down to the river, carry a lot of sediment from the farm runoff and really don't have any uh, intrinsic habitat to them at all. They don't meander at all. So the photo on the right just shows its uh, position to the North Platte River. That straight line in the middle is uh, uh, Spotted Tail Creek. This is after phase one of the project was done. You can see on the left that there's a new stream created with meander in it. This was done with uh, Platte River Basin's environment. Uh, they applied for an NAT grant and we used some aquatic habitat money to uh, help this along. It also has a wetland project there on the left. You can see, you can't see all the other one, but it's all dug out that they got down into the groundwater and with some recharge, this is just kind of an overall project that's good for wildlife and fisheries. This was the main diversion where they cut into the uh, incised and straight shot channelized portion and run it off the meander. This was repaired or fixed permanently later in phase two of the project when they uh, bolstered it up and used bigger rock and put some uh, logs in there to keep it from eroding. Upstream of the diversion where the existing stream was, there's you can see the cross sections in there are boulder veins. Those were put in there for uh, habitat structures in the existing stream. 
The last thing we're going to do is coming up this very next two, three weeks, um, we'll go out and collect a bunch of willow shoots, soak them for a week, and then they will transplant them down onto the creek bank in the uh, predetermined areas to help from eroding the banks and put some shade over the, the new created stream and mainly just to hold the banks. Sawbelly Creek is up in the Pine Ridge. This is one of our streams that flows north into the Hat Creek drainage, and it had a severe flood in 2015. And the photo on the left shows you the pine timber and everything that come down, choked the whole stream up. And, and the right one shows where it just blew a whole wide uh, channel through the whole thing. It's trying to heal itself somewhat, but we have a um, engineering firm, EA, giving us a design, and we're gonna create some holes and. Uh, riffles and kind of re-meander this back down through the system and we got one more big log jam and silt uh, location to, to clean out and we're hoping to make this brook trout stream but yeah the good news bad news is it's already got brown trout in it and they're just doing excellent so you know, I got some brook trout coming to stock in it but it will still be a good trout stream with brown trout. Our next one is Bordeaux Creek and that's up in the Shadron area just east of Shadron. This is more of a watershed plan where it could include uh, private individuals if they want to get their land involved, the uh, U.S. For, uh, Forest Service on the upper end, and then our biggest portion is the lower end on the WMA where we have a contractor, a uh, hired design contractor, Watervation is the outfit, and they're giving us a plan to remove timber that's plugged in it, uh, plugged up the stream over time through floods, pullback banks, this is kind of a busy slide, I won't explain it all, but it's just the different um, avenues of uh, correction that we're gonna do to it. Probably use a track hole in some and just remove timber in some of the other places and some places don't need a whole lot. Anyway, this is all uh, being done with aquatic habitat money. So the last ones we did on our own, this is Squaw Creek on the Ponderosa Wildlife Management Area and Monroe Creek on Gilbert Baker. These are both brook trout streams and Monroe Creek, we went in, we rented a track hole for a month, a little bitty one. And we went out and we needed an access road for the wildlife guys to do fire uh, control, weed control, and just their general wildlife management work on the area. And in conjunction with that, we put in tubes so that we'd have fish passage where there used to be just big rock flows and flow throughs. And then we dug a lot of pools to enhance the uh, overwintering trout habitat. We have already moved some fish up in there and I got a few coming uh, tomorrow that are coming up from the, into the valley. And then the very next week gonna bring a few up into the Pine Ridge and brook trout that we raised. So it kind of enhance this a little bit. We won't have to stock this on an annual basis or probably ever again, but it's got good gravel and this was kind of an exciting project. And we had a whole crew show up to do it. We had uh, the wildlife guys from Ponderosa and uh, Nate Rao and Rick and oh yeah, we, we kind of had a good time doing it. We spent about 10 days up there, hard work. <clears throat> anyway, we'll put this off on to Joe now. He's gonna talk to you about the Fort Robinson plan. Thanks, Al. Another one of our major projects we have going on with our aquatic habitat projects is our Fort Robinson plan. Um, this is a pretty big plan. Uh, I kind of started out with the project Al wrote up years ago, and it really got pushed forward with the, the overall Fort Robinson management plan. Um, it identified 12 different water bodies and the issues that are associated with them. Uh, 11 of those water bodies on the fort uh, had potential for fishery. Um, some of them were active fisheries, some of them not so much active. Um, so we knew this is kind of a big plan. Uh, having this many, many bodies of water at one time, we decided we're gonna break this up into a two phase project. Uh, phase one is gonna include the Grable Pond, the Cherry Creek Complex, which includes Cherry Creek Pond and its diversion pond and the Ice House Complex. Um, by breaking this into two phases, it, didn't only help out with funding, but it also allowed us to maintain fisheries on the fort the entire time, since this is kind of a, a popular area for anglers to go. Uh, phase one was completed uh, last spring, spring of 2020. 
Um, phase two is going to try to progress on this year. We're still in the design phase. A little bit of a, a hiccup in the design with Carter P. Johnson. Uh, some dam safety uh, came back and reclassified that dam as a high hazard. So we're trying to incorporate some improvements into it that would meet some of the qualifications for that dam. Uh, but we're still optimistic, even with permitting and this new classification uh, sets back a little bit. But we're hoping we can begin work on this in 2021. Just to highlight a few of the issues that are involved with this, uh, this project, you know, kind of what was identified and uh, stuff we're improving. So a lot of the outlet structures in these ponds were a hundred years old or older. Um, a lot of these were failing, cracked, broken, just not operating the way they should. So one of our goals was to uh, replace these water control structures throughout these ponds. A little slow on the reaction here. I jumped ahead a little bit. All right, so another one of our main issues was a lot of these ponds were either designed shallow or they've been tilted in from the 91 flood that, that hit the area. Um, as you can see here, this is Crazy Horse Pond. Uh, this is pretty much tilted in 100%. It vegetates to the surface and this picture was taken pretty earlier in the year and come mid-May on, it's pretty much unfishable. But this is a common issue through most of the ponds that were on the fort. So one of our main goals was to deepen it, deepen our ponds, get a better site, better shape and structure for the ponds so they can maintain a, a more long-term fishery. As with a lot of our aquatic habitat projects, we're bringing angler access. Uh, this is an example of one of the old fishing piers that was used on the Grable Ponds. Um, this was just a salvage dock that was brought in just to get anglers out to deeper water. Uh, we wanted to incorporate some of these dock deep water access points into this uh, aquatic habitat project. Um, but we also wanted to make sure we brought some uh, ADA accessible docks to this or fishing access points in, in, into these projects where we could. Some of the ponds, whether they had a dock or not, you couldn't hardly get to the water. Uh, the steep terrain, rough terrain, and heavy vegetation made it almost impossible for bank access. So uh, one of the major parts of this project was clearing and grubbing on a lot of these shorelines or trying to develop some sort of shoreline access. So this here's a picture of uh, the completed project out on Cherry Creek Pond. Um, just to give you some examples of the stuff that we did, uh, this pond was deepened, restructured. We put some in-pond habitat structures in in the form of rock piles. You can see the big uh, granite rock piles on the side. Uh, we used some artificial habitat structures, um, some Georgia cube designs, and then even have some gravel beds and areas. Uh, this pond in particular had this tree brush line all the way around the outside that you can see. So we built this shelf down in the bottom to give us access, a little more bank access along this, uh, this near side for anglers. This is an example of one of the water control structures that we, that we put in. Uh, we used both these riser structure, dam board structures, and we used agri drains where we could get them in. And they were all equipped with trash guards to, to help out. Some of the angler access features we, we included in a lot of the ponds were kayak launches. Um, kayak fishing is getting really more, a lot more popular, uh, especially around our state park ponds where, we, where they're allowed. And uh, adding this feature really helps anglers get in and out with those kayaks.
This is an example of one of the fishing pads we put in, uh, one of our ADA pads. It's got a concrete top. And if you can see off in the distance where those two anglers are fishing out there, uh, that's a secondary, another access pad, it's similar to this one, which has a gravel top to it. Just a couple of these little features to get you to deeper water. Another example of one of our uh, access points, uh, this is a sheltered fishing pier on the gravel ponds. Um, there's not a lot of trees out here in Western Nebraska and uh, getting a way, place where you can get out, easy access to the water and produce a little shade is pretty valuable. This is the, the fishing pier we have on Cherry Creek Pond. Um, with the gravel approach coming to it, it's not ADA accessible. Um, however, within our design, we chose to uh, uh, incorporate these lower handrails throughout it, just to make it easier for kids and stuff to fish off the end, get access to that deeper water. Um, Carter P. Johnson and Crazy Horse will incorporate a lot of these different types of designs, whether it's the in-lake in habitat structures or some of these access point um, type designs. So kind of looking forward to this completed project, get a chance to get out there. Um, it's pretty neat how it's turning out. I'm very pleased with it. I think a lot of our anglers are too. With that, I'll let Zach tell you a little bit about what's going on in Cherry County. All right, good evening. Thanks, Joe. Evening. My name is Zach Brashears and I'm a biologist stationed here in Valentine, Nebraska. Uh, I just wanted to get an overview of a couple of our projects we've had going on for the last few years. And the first one I wanted to touch on was the main uh, area at Merritt Reservoir with our boat ramp. This boat ramp was completed in 2017 with a breakwater directly to the north to protect it from northerly winds. And also as part of this project, maybe, we plan on installing another, whoop, installing another breakwater off of Willow Cove Campground. Um, this breakwater was exposed to extend 200 feet out into the reservoir to protect that boat ramp from southwesterly winds. Um, due to higher than normal water levels since 2017, we haven't been able to get that breakwater installed yet. The rock's still sitting there and we're ready to go. Hopefully we get this installed in 2021. Um, this breakwater should provide some extra bank angling access for people there at Willow Cove to get out to a little bit deeper water as well. When this project was completed in 2017, we also purchased an on the water dock there at, Merit, uh, at the main area at Merritt Reservoir. Um, this dock was approximately 60 foot long and due to us not getting the breakwater installed and a bunch of other things, this area just seems to receive a ton of wind action and just a mess there. Uh, park staff has quite a few problems there with being able to anchor the dock so it stays in place and causes a lot of problems for, for our anglers there. We've had quite a few meetings over the last several months. Um, we hope to, hopefully we'll take care of some of these issues this year. We plan to remove some of the rock along the ramp at Merritt was, which has been causing some issues with boats and also probably try to purchase a new dock that will be located there. Um, this dock just doesn't seem to be working for what we want. We're looking at installing a dock similar to the one we have installed at Box Butte Reservoir. Um, as you can see, this dock is installed on a rail system, so it's always anchored in place. Um, also, one of the key factors on this is it's very easy to move up and down with our fluctuating reservoir conditions. Um, takes one person and one piece of equipment. So, as I said, discussions are still being made, but hopefully this fall, um, maybe we'll get the breakwater in and also install a new dock. If we're looking at a new dock like this, we have to wait till our reservoirs are at their lowest point so we can install this rail system. Also another project we've had going on in the Valentine area is the Valentine National Wildlife Refuge Aquatic Habitat Project. Um, this project started several years ago with a bunch of dredging and 
number of structures have been put in throughout the refuge. And then the second phase has kind of been the renovation portion of the, of the lakes. We renovated Pelican Lake in 2018. Um, and then due to higher than normal water levels over 2019 and 2020, we have not been able to complete any more renovations. We're hoping to continue this renovation process in 2021 with the renovation of Hackberry Lake. Um, the bag limits have been, or not bag limits, length limits have been rescinded off this lake for the last couple of years. Um, people have been utilizing these fish, taking them home and stuff. And I know for a fact they were just catching fish there a few days ago through the ice, but probably wouldn't trust the ice these days right now. Um, just for a quick tidbit on Pelican Lake, our fisheries is doing pretty well there. We renovated that lake in 2018. We have bluegill already eight inches long in there in two years. Our yellow perch are 10 inches, crappie are seven inches, and our bass are between 10 to 12 inches. Um, unfortunately, we did not control all the common carp in Pelican Lake. We have those back in the lake. Um, so in 2019, we needed to go in with an additional predator. And instead of Northern Pike, we decided on tiger muskie. Um, in 2019, we stocked about 36,000 tiger muskie in there from um, anywhere from fingerling to advanced 14 inch fish. So they ought to provide a pretty unique fishery in the future. And yeah, hopefully we'll see some of those. We'll survey it every year to see how that population is doing. Um, the last project I have in Cherry County that I've been working on quite a bit lately. Um, we started a musky project. Well, for people that don't know, in 2020, Merritt Reservoir has a, um, had a 50 inch minimum put in place on it. We also wanted to get a research project to kind of look at the musky numbers in Merritt Reservoir and as well Cottonwood Steverson, which has a 40 inch minimum. So we got in a partnership with the University of Nebraska at Kearney and plan to look at our musky populations. Uh, this project, like I said, was supposed to start in 2020, but due to COVID, we had to push it off to 2021. Um, this spring, we plan on installing pit tags, which can be seen in the bottom right corner. We plan on installing these in the musky, all the adult musky we collect at Merritt Reservoir this spring. Um, the top right picture shows us um, injecting one with a syringe. They're a rather small tag. They're injected into the muscle just under the dorsal fin and won't be visible to anglers. Um, this project should show us how fast these fish are growing in Merritt and Cottonwood Steverson Lakes, and as well as how old these fish are. We're gonna collect some pelvic fins and hopefully be able to age these fish. We also wanted to know some information on whether these musky actually reproduce in these systems or not. Um, next year, our musky stockings at Merritt Reservoir will be 12 to 14 inch fish and they will also be installed with pit tags. This will allow us to see how fast these smaller fish grow in these environments, as well as some estimates on survival there. So, and with that, I will turn it back over to Joe for our Northwest fishing forecast. Hey, Zach. Before we get started on kind of what, what we have for data, we'll kind of start with where this data comes from. Um, we do standardized sampling every year in majority of our lakes. Uh, not all lakes get sampled every year. So this data you're gonna see is just from the lakes that were sampled in 2020. Um, if there's, when we break it down by species, um, if there's a, a, a good lake, there'll be a good fishing opportunity this year that we feel from angler reports or just has a, a history to it. Um, you know, we'll mention that as well uh, as we go through it. It'll be a spot worth trying this year. Um, but when we look at sampling of fish, we're looking at different gear types per, depending on what species we're looking for. Uh, when we manage our nearshore species, we use equipment called trap nets. Uh, that includes bluegills, crappies, yellow perch, northern pike. Uh, these are essentially uh, a big fish trap that has a lead that funnels the fish from the, the near shore as they move around into the trap. Another piece of equipment we use is electrofishing. 
this picture down here is an example of our boat electrofishing unit. It sends an electrical current through the water that will stun the fish. Uh, it gives a chance to capture them and uh, take some measurements off them and release them. Uh, we use this for both largemouth bass and our trout surveys. Uh, the trout are done with a, a little bit smaller uh, equipment. We use, either use a tote barge or a backpack electric fisher. Then for our offshore species such as walleye, sawgai, and channel catfish, uh, we set gill nets out in the fall of the year. Uh, these essentially look like a chain link fence underwater with a variety of different uh, mesh sizes. So it's an entanglement gear as the fish hit them, they tangle up and it uh, gives a chance to catch a variety of size of fish. So, but this is a, a good way we sample our offshore species. We'll start off talking about walleye and sawgai. Um, before I get into the data too much, I kind of explain how these graphs are set up. Now these are bar graphs and each one of these color codes represents a different size structure of fish. So the light blue on the bottom is a smaller size. In this case, they're under 10 inch walleye. Uh, the red's a little bit larger, they're 10 to 15 inch. The yellow beige is about is 15 to 20 inch fish. Uh, the blue green is 20, 25 fish and the purple is fish over 25 inches. And the same standard is gonna pass along from uh, each species we talk about. The numbers on the left indicate the taller the bar, the more fish we catch per sampling and represents a, a higher trend in abundance for that species. So in Nebraska, we stock, or we have uh, both walleye and sawgai fisheries. Now sawgai seem to do a little bit better in some of our turbid water bodies. We use them in, in those examples. Um, walleye seem to do better in uh, clear water uh, reservoirs. Uh, but one thing I want to point out here, uh, you know, Winters Creek this year was our highest density walleye population. Merritt's the third highest. Uh, Big Alkali was the highest sawgai. We got some pretty good walleye and sawgai fishing out here in western Nebraska. Um, and it's pretty much related to habitat. We just have the, the good habitat, cool water habitat um, that some of these species thrive in. If we look at combine all these, both sawgai and walleye together, as I mentioned, um, probably one of our, or some of our best lakes this year in order to target walleye and sawgai are going to be Winters Creek uh, with a good portion of those fish over 15 inches, uh, big alkali uh, for sawgai. Um, however, if you're looking for bigger fish, uh, Marist definitely has the bigger walleye for our district. Um, Minotaur, our total abundance, is, total abundance is usually right around 25 to 30 fish per net. So we're down a little bit in abundance on Minotaur. Uh, however, we're carrying a better size structure than 52. Um, we don't usually see too many fish over 20 inches, and this year we've actually seen some fish over 25. So a little bit bigger fish, even though our numbers are down. I think they should have a good harvest year there. Channel catfish. Uh, I threw up the whole statewide map for channel catfish um, just to show you kind of what our abundance is across the state. You know, we have some pretty high density catfish lakes in the state. However, when we look at just our Northwest district, uh, it's not uncommon for us to have a lot lower density rates. So, um, you know, right around 10 to 15 is usually as high as we see. Uh, in 2020, Lake Minotaur had the highest density, uh, but still a low density across the state. However, we do see good quality out here. So, um, anglers looking for large catfish this year should definitely fish Merritt or Box Butte, even though it wasn't sampled. Uh, consistently produces some fish over 15 pounds. Northern pike. Our highest density northern pike this year during 2020 surveys was, was collected on the Valentine Refuge. Uh, both Dewey and Hackberry Lake, they're pretty similar. Um, a little bit bigger fish were collected in Hackberry. Uh, however, remember we're, we're got Hackberry's drawn down, anglers going out there might encounter some lower lower than normal water levels uh, and those bag limits have been rescinded so uh, anglers can keep some bigger fish there. Uh, anglers looking for big pike this year should uh, also look towards Smith Lake. Smith Lake had some pretty nice pike in there over 34 inches and uh, we had quite a few reports at Box Butte some pretty good pike this winter. Bluegill. I threw a statewide 
graph up here again, just kind of show you some of the catfish. Um, you know, some of these eastern lakes really get really high densities of bluegill, um, exceeding 80 per net. Uh, we don't typically see that in a lot of our western lakes. We're more of a, a lower density, but we have pretty good quality. Um, Smith Lake did have the highest catch rate in 2020. Uh, with quite a few of those, bluegill are really nice. Um, even though it says over eight inches, I'd say most of those are probably over nine inches. Um, but most of our Sandhill lakes in particular produce quite a few bluegills over eight inches, uh, good growth rates. So if you're looking for really big bluegills this year, uh, both Smith Lake and Pry Lake had quite a few of them that are right around that 10 inch mark. Yellow perch. Rat and beaver had the highest catch rate in 2020. Um, however, you need to remember that rat and beaver has a special reg on it where uh, the 12 inch minimum size limit. Um, and in 2020, we did see some perch over 12 inches in there. So there's some to harvest. We're really trying to build that population up to uh, get some good numbers of fish over 12 inches. See, how, see if we can get some larger fish in there. Uh, Fry Lake had the second highest density. However, the majority of these fish were made up of young, small, short fish. Um, it's encouraging for uh, down the road that we might get some, some big year classes coming through. Uh, Angler's looking for some bigger perch this year, um, just some good harvestable size ones. It looks like Watts and Smith Lake both have some good populations. Um, of some of those, you know, 10 to 12 inch fish, um, you know, pushing right around 10 inches on Smith. And then Home Valley had a few over 12 inches, but it was still pretty low catch rates. Crappies. Whitney Lake actually had the highest density in the state. Um, we have a big year class in there right now. It's about 10 to 12 inches. They're pushing closer to 11. Um, did the majority of those. Uh, with the good food source in there on shad and good growth rates, it wouldn't surprise me if quite a few of these pushed over that 12 inch mark this year. Um, but just a phenomenal crappie lake right now. Uh, second highest catch rate was Cottonwood Steverson. Uh, this lake may be challenging to fish, but it's loaded full of crappies right now. And since we put gizzard chat in the last couple of years, we're starting to get some shoulders on them. So they're actually good looking crappies in there. One I probably went overlooked for an opportunity to catch a bunch of fish. Um, Angler's looking for bigger crappies. Uh, Home Valley and Fry Lake both had some pretty nice crappies over 12 inches in 2020. Largemouth bass. We didn't get a lot of bass surveys conducted out on the west on the west end of our district. Um, quite a few were conducted out in Cherry County. Zach did a good job out there this year. I guess we were slacking a little bit, looking at our numbers. Um, but with high water still in a lot of our lakes, it was hard getting in to get a good representative sample on our on our bass population. So it was an off year for most of them. Um, we did get into Fry Lake with the really good population, it's the highest catch rate we saw in 2020. Um, Historically, with most guys that fish Fry Lake, it's had a lot of bass in that 12 to 14 inch range. And we're just seeing those fish pushing over the 15 inch mark. Um, quite a few of them are actually pushing closer to 16, 17. So if you're looking for a, a good high catch rate um, with some nice bass in it, uh, Fry would be one worth hitting this year. A lot of our lakes uh, throughout the sand hills, though, do have some good bass populations, especially if they don't have any carp in them. Um, we see that on the Valentine Refuge. Our carp-free lakes have higher density, with good size structure, but our carp lakes down there, uh, Dewey, Clear, Willow, still have some bass over 15 inches, even though low density. One other thing I wanted to do this slide up here, you know, if there's a species of fish that you want to go target, that we don't necessarily sample for on a regular basis, it might not be a high priority species or a tough to sample species. Um, or just an oddball thing that you might know we have on our area. Um, drop us an email, give us a phone call, you know, ask us about it. And odds are we've encountered them, we have an idea where they're at. We can point you in the right direction, even though it's not necessarily put together in a standard survey. And the last thing I want to point on, as Tony mentioned earlier, um, you know, invasive species are kind of a big, big concern we have in Nebraska. 
uh, when you're out and about, um, if you happen to see any invasive species, we got their our email address down here in the bottom. You know, uh, send us a link. Let us know what you see, what you're finding. Um, we can't be out everywhere in order to see them. You encounter some weird mussels on the shoreline or a weird vegetation that's kind of overgrown area. Let us know about it. Um, but we really want to indicate that we don't want you to we want you to clean, drain, and dry your watercraft before you move from one water body to the next, and really stop the spread of these invasive species in our area. Uh, we will be continuing to go out this year, especially on our reservoirs, and doing our annual monitoring for zebra mussels. Uh, it includes looking for the reproduction of the villagers. Um, we'll be doing that on Merritt in the here and Box Butte again this year. And here's just our contact information. Um, feel free to write it down, save it, give us a call, reach out to us anytime. We're here to help um, provide the information that we can. With that, we'll take any questions. So yeah, now's the time where uh, Jordan Cott is going to take over and, and uh, there's been quite a few questions that have popped into the chat and feel free to continue to ask as, uh, as things uh, come, into, come into your heads. Um, and as Dean mentioned before, this is a really valuable part of, part of the meeting, this feedback session, and, uh, and we just want to treat it as a, as a discussion and a conversation. So fire away. Nicely done, guys. Al, I'm going to direct this one to you. Uh, can you talk about um, where any cutthroat stockings will occur out in your, in your area this year? And if any of, any of those have been done so far? We haven't done any so far, but I think Bridgeport Middle Lakes, I think our golf course pond here gets some. And I think the White River is what I got going with some for stream fishery. And there could be more, but you know, pull up our site, Outdoor Nebraska Fishing Reports. Uh, they'll be on there. Yeah, that's good. That's a good thing to mention, Al. Uh, all of our stocking reports are online. If you scroll up through the chat, uh, we put a link to our uh, our stocking page, and so you can uh, scroll through there and uh, search for. Uh, where we've stocked cutthroats. Um, kind of along the same uh, line of cutthroats, uh, some of our folks from the eastern part of the state are looking for to complete their uh, trout slam and looking for opportunities for cutthroats and brook stock or uh, brook trout um, opportunities out in the northwest part of the state. Uh, where are those opportunities? And um, I guess, let's see. I guess maybe just talk about where those opportunities are and when those uh, types of stockings typically occur. Uh, yeah, those I just mentioned would be the cutthroat. The brook trout, we got natural reproduction going on Squaw Creek at uh, Ponderosa. It's a WMA, wildlife management area. Gilbert Baker, Monroe Creek. Uh, south branch of uh, Soldiers Creek in the Wood Reserve is probably our blue ribbon one. And the middle branch also has some there too. So, and we're just introducing some in the upper parts of the stream in the North Platte Valley too. So it's kind of a wait and see, you know, how that works out. We've got a few put in the upper Grable Pond or the South Grable Pond. And then we also have some in the Cherry Creek Diversion Pond. These are the ones that Joe just uh, showed, you know, on a, a report on the Fort Rob Rehab. All right, very good. Uh, sticking with the trout theme. So the there's been a, a program to reintroduce the Lake McConaughey strain of rainbows. Could you uh, touch on that a little bit? I know there's been some individuals uh, by their own account have asked permission to hatch eggs with, in the valley streams. I think we have five streams right now that they're 
hatching them in. And the whole idea is, the whole hope is that they will hatch, recruit by going downstream, growing two years in the lake, and then returning. And uh, it's only in the valley streams that that's going on. Someone had a question earlier about us doing them in Lake Ogallala, but that's not in the system. So the um, system has changed quite a bit. So, you know, the verdict's still out on whether or not it's going to work or not. All right. And I got one more trout uh, question for you here before we move on to something else. Uh, can you just touch on why the numbers of cutthroat stock, uh, just the number of cutthroat that are stocked are lower? Are they just more difficult to get and raise in the hatchery or uh, just what's the uh, thought process behind those numbers being a little bit less than uh, maybe compared to a typical rainbow uh, trout stocking? We get these in, in different lots, just like brook trout are a real problem. Uh, brook trout have bacterial kidney disease, so we can't bring them into our main cold water hatcheries. So we get uh, cutthroats on an every other year basis. So you'll see, I'm trying to get things uh, switched over to maybe do brooks, like up in the wood reserve one year and then cutthroats the next. So we've got some leftovers in there, but the numbers are kind of hard to hard to raise. They're, they were hard to haul. They're getting it down. Our hatchery guys have done a good job with it, but uh, catchability on them that I've seen isn't as good as rainbows. And, you know, they're supposed to be a unique fish anyway. So, you know, we don't put them out in great numbers is kind of the main thing. This next question has to do about uh, walleye stocking in uh, Lake Minotaur. Uh, Recently, you guys have been doing walleye fry. Are there any plans to switch that to fingerlings or have the fry been uh, doing, doing well out there for you? It gets fingerling. It gets fingerling this year. And we also put uh, fingerling up in uh, Big Lake Alice and they drain down through the system. And they are basically advanced fish when they get to a Minotaur. We also do yellow perch up there too. And that's why we have kind of a perch fishery in Minotaur. So uh, we have done fry before. Sometime, and one time I did fry and fingerling. I couldn't tell which one you know, did the best out of it, but the fingerling has, has always come through for us, it seems like. We have, we have good waters out here, good plankton early in the year. All right. Uh, this next one deals with the refuge. And I think Zach, you touched on this a little bit uh, during the presentation, but uh, can you just kind of talk about the uh, general refuge renovation plan or Al, if you want to talk about it as well. Sure, I can handle that. Um, as I said in the presentation, we renovated Pelican in 2018. Our plans were to continue um, on a step-by-step -step basis throughout the refuge and hopefully have some of those lakes that were initially renovated uh, firing by the time we got to the last of the renovations. Um, due to higher than normal precipitation over the last couple of years, um, we've had some crazy water levels out here and we just had to put the re renovations on hold, but we are continuing with the plan. We're looking at doing Hackberry in 2021, um, clear in, or Dewey in 2022, and then clear and Willow in 2023. Um, who knows? We can't predict mother nature. I'm sure they'll throw some hooks and loops and stuff at us, but that's our plan as of now, so. All right, thank you. Uh, Al, this next one is dealing with uh, uh, Spotted Tail Creek again, and uh, mentions about making it uh, ADA accessible uh, in the original plan. Is that still going to happen or what kind of access will be there? I think it's just foot access now. You know, there was some talk about that, and I can't remember now if they are going to allow for ADA. It's quite a ways down to that diversion, and I thought they were going to allow it right to at where we diverted it from the main creek. But maybe uh, if Porth's on here, he can remind me. Or Brett. Yeah, they, they must not be here. There was, there's talk about letting them drive down there, but then that kind of opened up access to everybody with vehicles to run over the area. So they, they kind of put it in limbo for now. 
Sure. Uh, the next one is dealing with uh, Cottonwood Steverson and the thought process behind stocking wipers in there. Good. At least someone was paying attention to that. We put gizzard <laughs> shad in there to uh, uh, manage around the carp. That thing is a pig hole with carp. And because of the shad stock, and you saw our graph on uh, our crappie coming on, our muskie population is really good in there. And they're quite large they're doing well but they've switched over you know they get good survival up to a point and you know you know they're eating carp that's the only thing in there they could have the shad aren't quite that big yet but anyway we need another predator in there to just kind of put some competition on the carp they'll feel that competition and won't recruit and as soon as we can get them down a little bit in numbers we're also stocking a walleye in there too at a pretty good rate so we're hoping for great things out of that it's pretty turbid right now for a site feeder, but I haven't seen a lake yet that you haven't put a wiper in that the little suckers live. So that's, that's why we went with them. We electrofished last summer. I don't know if we did even 35, 40 minutes. And I think we got 65 of them in the middle of the day. So they're surviving. We'll see how much they grow this year. All right. To add on that, we've also been doing some saw guy stockings there as well, which we've had a little bit of success with both saw guy and walleye, so. Mm -hmm. Very good. I think uh, Mark Porath with our aquatic habitat program is back on. He can touch base um, regarding the um, uh, dry spotted tail uh, ADA uh, project. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. Um, what since this is a public-private uh, partnership with Pre uh, Preby Platte River Basin Environments, um, they wanted to have an opportunity to be able to have events at the place for either Trout Unlimited or special occasions to bring people down, and if necessary, you know, have handicapped accessibility right near that corner of the stream where we hope to have some really good fishing. So this spring, we are in the process of building a, a, a landing pad, if you will. Uh, that will be down by that corner. The difference is, is won't be, the gate won't be open all the time. Uh, that's one of those things we want to coordinate ahead of time uh, with the owners to make sure they can get access down there. But uh, otherwise, it's very difficult to get from the top of that bank it's where, uh, up where the parking lot is, the beginning of it. It's a heck of a sheer strap street, big, big drop off of the edge here. So it's kind of hard to get down there. But we have done a lot of a lot of shaping to try to make a nice, easy walking down, but the upper part is not wheelchair accessible. All right. Thank you, Mark. All right, we're getting a, a few questions regarding the refuge. Um, what kind of feedback are you guys getting regarding the uh, reduced bag limit on bluegill on, on uh, Pelican and have you guys given any consideration of expanding that to some of the other uh, other water bodies on the refuge, such as duck and rice? Well, I haven't got much feedback on that at, at this point. I'm sure it's going to start as soon as they start catching some nine, 10 inch bluegill. So Zach, have you heard anything? And we're waiting to see where we're going to go here. with it. I haven't heard much either. Uh, of course, it's a pretty new regulation. We'd like to look at Pelican Lake and try to ac assess it a little bit, but I'd like to look at other lakes in the future for possible other lakes to include in that, um, try to provide some more trophy potential in the area, so. When, when you look at some of the graphs Joe was showing, you know, it should put, showed some pretty low catches on perch, you know, of quality size or bluegill. We can't be every, where on the proper time. We have about a 14 day window to do perch correctly. Bluegills probably the same way, maybe three weeks. And uh, we've got some quality panfish fisheries out there, even though those bar graphs are pretty low. So yeah, we're gonna look and see how pelican you know, pans out for us and rat and beaver with the perch size limit. And they've also uh, put a perch bag limit in the Eastern part of the state. So once we start that in the state, 
yeah, maybe we can look at something like that out here. We, we catch the fishing pressure out here through the ice. Yeah, as I said, we've had some phenomenal growth in Pelican Lake to produce some eight inch bluegill in two years is pretty amazing. So that lake can kick out some fish. So we'll just see how it goes in the future and we'll be looking at it each year. Kind of along those same lines, have you guys considered any sort of slot limits on uh, all species, but including bluegill to uh, maybe keep some of those larger uh, specimens in the, in the water body for, to keep those proper genetics and whatnot in there? Any, any thoughts on on slot limits on panfish, predator fish on the refuge? Well, we haven't looked at any uh, on the refuge yet, but in-house, Joel and I have been visiting about slot length limit on, on purge. There's, there's probably some potential there. Let people go home with more fish of a smaller size, maybe leave uh, some in the individual slot. We aren't quite there yet with all our, our fishing rigs, but you know, once we get some information back from Rat and Beaver and see how that functions and some of these full sand hill lakes that we have. Maybe we'll come up with something, but that's a discussion we got to take over with our supervisors too, and then take it to the public and see how they like it. Um, regarding the uh, renovation of Hackberry, what uh, do you, allow the public to come watch those renovations or do you uh, shut down access to uh, those water bodies during a renovation? Uh, usually on fish and wildlife service lands, it is shut down. I'm unsure on Hackberry. That'd be a good question for Juan Carlos Geese. He's the assistant refuge program manager down there at Valentine. Um, but I don't think, I mean, the public road 16B goes right by the northwest corner of Hackberry. So I don't see how we can shut that down. So th there may be some possibilities. Um, it'd be a good question to give the refuge manager, Juan Carlos, a call down there at Valentine and pick his brain on it. So. Sure. Uh, kind of transitioning away from the refuge a little bit. Um, has the trout slam put any observed strain on your brook trout densities? No, not that I've ever seen. No, it's put more interest out here because we get more calls about it, just like the question that come up tonight. So those are good things. People just never realized that we had such unique little brook trout fishery up here in the Pine Ridge and places too. And it's really unique. So it, it's kind of a, a little treasure that we kind of had to ourselves. So it's kind of good that the public knows more about it. Absolutely. Another tidbit that Daryl Bauer mentioned in the chat is that 80% of the fish entered in that trout slime have been released. So mm -hmm. the vast majority of those fish um, are being put back. Like Al mentioned too, there's a couple areas where we did some improvements this year, digging pools on Squaw Creek and Monroe Creek, trying to get better ang angler access to some of those trout or brook trout fisheries. Um, you know, there's a few resources out there that most anglers don't even know about because they're difficult to fish. So that was one of the goals for um, doing those improvements. Absolutely. Yeah, we're uh, Joe, probably a little, we we're probably a little short on some of our bass surveys because we were running a track hoe and digging too for a month. <laughs> Can't be yeah. everywhere. Yeah, that's one one common thing we run into. Joe, could you maybe uh, briefly touch on how to how to interpret the sampling charts again? Um, sure. A couple folks were a little little confused on that. I'm going to see if I can go back to one of them.
There you go. We'll look at the crop you want here. So when we look at our, our graph here, each one of these bar graphs, individual bars, is one lake's sampling results. Uh, the different colors on here indicate the different size structures that were collected of, of fish that were collected in that, uh, that particular sample for the, for the year. Um, the size of the bar indicates the number of fish that were collected for each one of those size groups. So if we look at Whitney, for example, uh, we caught almost 140 crappies per frame net. And out of those, uh, there were some eight to 10 inch crappies. Is this lower colored one? Uh, it looks like about 22 per net. And uh, we had a, a large density of those crappies collected. Um, almost 100 per net were uh, 10 to 12 inch crappies. Uh, but we did see some with this little purple color at the top indicates that we did see some that were over that 12 inch mark. So, and that just portrays across each one of these for comparison. Uh, the taller the graph, uh, the bar, the higher the catch rate for that lake, and then the different uh, color coding for the, each one of those uh, indicates the size structure of that population, if that answers the question. Thanks, Joe. Um, do you guys do any work with uh, pickerel out there? And how often do you guys encounter those just during your standard surveys? We find them in the sand hill, those small sand hill streams once in a while. I think Leander Creek. And we'd have to ask our Spooner, he's on here somewhere. I think those guys saw some out in uh, Cherry County, Western Cherry on one of those upper drainages, but they're common enough, but they're generally on private ground, not where, you know, you get a lot of access for the people. We have seen a few of them on uh, Cottonwood SRA during a frame net survey one year. Uh, so they're, they're common throughout the area, but we don't necessarily go out and target them in a survey approach. Uh, they're one that shows up more often in our stream surveys when they're present. Yeah, they'll show not up. Not very big, so I think it's... Go ahead, Zach. Yeah. They'll show up in a lot of our, some of our, some of our sandhill lakes that are really, really vegetated. Um, they show up fairly often in West Long and Watts on the Valentine Refuge. So hmm. that would be, if I was going to target a grass pickerel, that would be where I would go. All right. Um, let's see. Have you guys put Northern Pike in Island Lake? No. No, Northern Pike have been stocked in Crescent Lake, our Crescent Lake WMA, the one that's on school land, but Island Lake has not been stocked with them. All right. Well, that, that answers the next question I had. Um, speaking of the Crescent uh, Refuge down there, what are the what are the plans for it, or what what are you guys doing down there? Could you talk a little bit about uh, about the Crescent Crescent uh, Refuge and the fisheries down there? Yeah, we're got in plans. Uh, if anybody's familiar with it, there's a Smith Lake on the Crescent Lake Refuge, so we call it Smith Fish and Wildlife Service. And our plans, we're drawing it down right now. And we're planning to renovate it this May, hopefully, and then come back with a fish stocking um, once we get a little bit of water back into it. Hopefully we get our groundwater's in still pretty good shape down there. So we got some pretty, pretty good flows. So that's our plan there. We've got a good fish population going on in Crane Lake and Island Lake right now. And those are our, our fishing lakes. Those are our water bodies that we can fish. Oh, and also, I guess we haven't opened up to uh, watercraft now, too. You can take float tubes and uh, a legal boat, you know. There's not a big boat ramp on any of them, but 
you can take a watercraft on them now too. And they're open year round where they were closed before just for ice fishing. Um, is there anything that can be done to stop the fish uh, from moving down the lake in uh, Blue Creek? Or I guess staying in the lake and, and moving out into Blue Creek? We don't see any evidence of anything down there. We survey them in the Blue Creek itself and we don't see any evidence of them moving downstream. We see a lot of evidence of anything we put in Crescent that ends up in Blue Lake upstream. And currently water's not running out right now. It, it did for two years straight or better, but that's a rarity. You know, that's, we haven't seen that in all the years I've been out here, but once, and then, then we run for almost three years in a row here. So two and a half. All right. And a little um, update on Blue Lake here. I'll just chime in. You know, water yep, level has been so high in that general area that the upper end of Hackberry pretty much flooded the whole access trail getting up the hill to Blue Lake. Um, the habitat up there doesn't even look the same right now. Uh, we did get in to do a survey this past year, but we had to go across country, across the hills for us to even get in there. Um, and it wasn't easy. I don't see the, uh, that old trail being open anytime soon. Uh, however, we have approached the Mormon church about trying to find a new trail, new route to go in there. And uh, the refuge uh, ranch hand up there, is, he's kind of investigating it a little bit for us. So we're, we're working with them, trying to get us access to it. Um, as far as the fishery goes, we do have, like Al mentioned, uh, we found some sawgai in there. Although sawgai have never actually been stocked in Blue Lake. Um, they've been requested for it, but we couldn't even get a hatchery truck in there but they're swimming up from Crescent Lake where they are stocked. And we have a, a population with Saugai, Northern Pike. Uh, we've even documented some muskies that have swam up from, from Crescent. So, um, but overall our fishery looks identical to Crescent Lake. Um, between the two, uh, I mean, access makes it a lot easier. Somebody needs to be fishing Crescent Lake. Um, and when we get a chance, we'll get in there and get blue opened up to what we can. All right, very good. That that pretty much answers my next question about access to Blue Lake because of the high high water levels. So appreciate that, Joe. The, the foresight there. Um, we'll switch over to uh, uh, Whitney Lake and fish stocking plan there. Um, particular angler would like to see some more walleye and perch among some other uh, predator species stocked in there. I guess, could you just talk about the, the current status of Whitney Lake and the fishery in there and any uh, plans for future fish stockings that are gonna occur there? It gets an annual stocking of sawguy right now, 50 per acre, so that's 45,000 um, sawguy. We use sawguy in there because it's been turbid. They, Iowa did a good study where maybe 80% of the population is within casting distance of the shoreline. And that place gets a tremendous amount of bank fishing pressure. Plus they're supposed to like the turbid water more and we're finding them. I think you know, we're, we aren't always able to get in there and get a good fall survey. That's why you didn't see it on the charts because it gets thrown down for irrigation so bad. You, we can't walk on mud just yet. So Anyway, it's doing quite well. We got shad going in there. Probably every three, four years, we stock with shad just so we don't get behind in the forage. And I have them coming this year for Whitney. So, and growth rates are good. Those uh, crappie wouldn't look like they are if there wasn't a good shad population in there. We kind of had a little bit of struggle on our shad population the last couple of years. Uh, we did get behind them. Uh, must have had a die off that we didn't realize and we did have some skinny fish for a couple of years but we got in put some adults in there last year found some good uh, shad reproduction the fish plumped up quite a bit we're looking pretty good we suspect with the way the ice was this year that we may have another die off so as Al mentioned we're coming back in this year with some more adults just to make sure we got food in the system and uh uh, we may continue doing it on an annual basis until we start seeing something a little bit different on it, just to make sure we have food in there. 
All right. Thanks, guys. Um, this one's dealing with uh, vegetation at Smith Lake. Uh, is there any plans for dealing with that there? And how easy does that vegetation move around on boats? And talk about uh, what anglers can do to help prevent that. I know we got uh, our AIS coordinator on, Chris Starr, too, if he wants to, uh, to chime in a bit on, on that as well. It is very easily moved on a boat trailer axle, on a spare tire, on your bumper hitch, on your electrical wires, and inside the boat, and on your fishing lure that you threw in the bottom of the boat and kept wet. And then just go back down to Fry Lake or Walgreen, you'll start the whole process there. So we encourage you to really do a clean sweep when you come from Smith. And as far as control, there's no way we can control it. We could treat the lake with a, a chemical called sonar. It'll kill everything in the lake and it'd cost about fifty, sixty thousand dollars and it'd have to be done annually probably. So it's not in our cards or our plans to do any more treatment than around the boat ramp we, we, or the dock and the ramp. We try and treat it each year to burn it down to kind of keep the boat trailers from dragging, dragging it out, but it's kind of an impossibility too. At this point, I think our plan is just containment and trying to keep it from spreading to other lakes. Um, education and outreach is our main goal on that. We have signage posted up, letting people know what is there. Um, one thing about the curly leaf and the weeds out there, you know, they die back come you know, end of July, um, even though it's hard fishing early in the year. Getting out there late in the year, that water either has an algae bloom on it, makes it look a little green, um, or it clears up pretty good. You can have some really good late summer fishing out there, and most people don't know about it because they think come mid-May, that lake's just choked with full of weeds and unfishable. But it's turned into a pretty good late season fishery now um, with that. But containment's our goal for that area right now until we find a better solution. Uh, yeah, we also have curly leaf pond weed established at Merritt Reservoir in Northwest Nebraska. So just a reminder for anglers to clean, drain, and dry. We hate for it to get spread all over, especially to other sandhill lakes where they cause problems like they do at Smith. Yeah, and just to reiterate that fact too, um, a lot of this invasive aquatic vegetation species spread by fragmentation. So actually, you know, a very tiny fragment of one plant can spread and create a whole other plant. So yeah, it's very important that there's no matter on your boats and clean drain and dry your boats. So yeah, that's the best way we, um, that we can control, you know, the spread of this invasive species. And most of our aquatic plants that way, so. Thanks guys. Uh, let's talk about big alkali and where we're at there. Um, I know we had some high water issues there that uh, kind of messed things up. What, uh, I guess maybe just touch on where things are at currently and any plans for that in the future. I know we got uh, Pat Molini with our wildlife division on that can touch base from the wildlife side. And we also got Mark Porath uh, that can uh, touch base a little bit on uh, the aquatic habitat side. And then uh, you guys can touch base on the, the fisheries management side as well. Uh, go ahead and why don't you start out? Start. Go ahead, Pat. You can probably handle this one. Good. Pat, you can go ahead and you can talk about the uh, the wildlife side of things first. Okay. Yeah, I can give you a little update on the situation there. As you know, it's we've experienced a lot of high water there lately, and and uh, you know it's affected the developments on the area as far as the cabins and wells, and even the entrance road has kind of been an ongoing issue, kind of turned into a low water crossing as of late. But uh, but anyway, we're you know, the general big picture is we're working with our engineering division and we're just assessing everything right now, basically where everything's at. Uh, in the short term, we have closed the cabins down. 
you know, we lost our vendor last year, well, year before. And uh, they, uh, you know, we've always fought mold and that sort of thing in the cabins or whatever. So we got to working through that with our engineering division, but in the short term, we're not allowing any, you know, cabin use, but we do have uh, electrical hookup for camping. We got the camping pads are still open. And, uh, and then, but there are wells where our wells are not in use right now. We got one that was damaged, an old one that was damaged in, in the flood. And then, uh, and then the other one is just not, it's not passing any of the tests for public use. So, so there's, those are some of the challenges we're looking at. So, you know, generally we're, we're trying to decide what the, you know, how to move forward long-term, what the big picture looks like, you know, it just, uh, uh, one of the big thing that concerns me is just that entrance road and how we address that. But, uh, but as far as the developments, yeah, we've, we, we've kind of shut them all down for right now, other than it is open for camping uh, and, and does have electric. So other than that, I think Mark can speak to the water level if you want, unless there's specific questions for me. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Yeah, we'll be, I'll, I'll let you know here if we get any, any uh, other specifics, but yeah, I appreciate that update. I can provide a little more light on the, the problem that's occurring there. Uh, there's a lot of interconnected Sand Hills lakes up in that area when we've had these really, really wet years the last three or four. It really kind of showed off uh, water going places that we hadn't seen for, for decades. And what has happened at, uh, at Big Alkali, there's actually a, an outlet on the North Shore and what has happened over time with south winds in the summertime has eroded the shoreline and moved sand in front of that outlet. And so it plugged that outlet up and, and over time it's actually raised the water level in the lake almost 18 inches. And so we addressed it this last year uh, by going in and cutting a channel back in there so we can get back to that normal operating level. And we're in the process of trying to find a way to actually dig that out uh, protect it to keep from sil uh, silting in again and hopefully get some control on that outlet. That's where we stand right now. Uh, just to touch base a little bit on the fisheries at Big Alkali, as you can see from the grass, our, our sawguy population is doing extremely well there. Um, getting a lot of anglers coming there just to target sawguy. Um, granted, the boat ramp, it's a, it's a wildlife management area, so I suggest bringing a smaller boat or anything if you want to fish big alkali. But we do have a decent crappie population. Um, Northern pike are hit and miss and do have a few bluegill and a few bass in there. Um, a ton of carp as with the rest of the refuge, so if you want to bring your bow and shoot us some carp, that would be great too. And we are, we're working on plans to improve that boat launch area as well that um, in the coming years that uh, hopefully we can get that, that implemented, um, which will be a, a vast improvement to where, where we're at now. All right. So this is kind of a generalized question, but uh, do you guys stock smallmouth in any lakes? And how is the density of smallmouth in Merritt? We I'll are, take this. yeah, we're doing this smallmouth. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so we've actually been stocking smallmouth in a few more areas, um, especially on this end of the state, uh, especially in our trout waters. The Fort Robinson project, rather than come back into those ponds with largemouth, uh, we came back in with smallmouth. Um, with just the hopes that they won't have quite the impact on our catchable rainbow trout stockings. Uh, so the Grable Ponds will have smallmouth. Um, Cherry Creek Pond will have smallmouth. Uh, we've also been trying smallmouth in a couple of our good clear water sandhill lakes. So Crane Lake on the Crescent Refuge has a smallmouth stocking and we're planning on coming back into Smith Lake following this renovation with smallmouth rather than largemouth. Uh, it'll just be something unique. We tried them a little bit in Blue Lake. Um, unfortunately, the largemouth came in and the carp came in. 
and they were doing really well for a while and then they kind of disappeared. So just starting off with a smallmouth only, I'm pretty optimistic on what they might do. So, Zach, you want to talk a little bit about Merit? Uh, yeah, we haven't sampled Merit in a couple of years, but we do see smallmouth there, not in any great numbers, but um, we do see some quality fish there pushing that 20 inch mark. Um, I assume part of that problem is our alewife population in there is really, really high, which preys on a lot of our young of the year. So pretty hard to get a smallmouth bass fishery established, but they are present and we see ups and downs there at Merritt Reservoir. So don't be surprised if you catch one. Um, so. One of our better reservoirs out here for smallmouth is Lake Minotaur. Um, the dam and even the inlet ditch uh, when the water's flowing can be a pretty good spot to target smallmouth. All right, thanks guys. Uh, another uh, pickerel question, have you ever seen any in the Saturn, Shadron City Ponds? Any what, pickerel, is that what you said? Yep. No, I haven't. No, I haven't seen anything. Okay. Just Northern Pike, they moved from Box Street Reservoir. <laughs> <laughs> um, what about rock bass in the Sand Hills? Any good places to fish for, for rock bass out there besides Merritt? Box uh, Street Reservoir. It's got some good good rock bass in it. Um, it was really good a few years ago. It's kind of hit or miss as far as cyclic. Um, other spots to check out are some of our grassland ponds. Uh, we have some rock bass up in uh, Agate Reservoir. And then uh, there's still some present in the, the lower Grable Pond. And Carter P has some in it. And we'll probably come back in following our renovation and put them back into a few of those systems. We also see them in the Valentine Mill Pond here in Valentine and the Hatchery Reservoir Pond. So be another spot if you got the Valentine to wet a line and maybe catch a rock bass. Uh, back to the Valentine Refuge, when do you think there might be some master angler bass back in Pelican? You want to take that, Al? <laughs> it, it shouldn't take too long. It usually takes our fish about uh, six years to get up there on a new lake, maybe seven. It, it takes us that long to get them to 15 inches out in our western environment out here after a lake is established. But being as that's newly renovated, they'll be growing quite a bit better. So maybe in, in six years. The growth is pretty phenomenal. And we plan on surveying that year. Um, probably every year from now on for a while, just to keep track of those populations, our bass, our bluegill, perch, crappie, um, tiger muskie. So look for that um, data to be coming out in the fishing forecasts and stuff like that. And our, I always put out a Valentine National Wildlife Refuge summary. I believe Jordan put a link to those fishing summaries you can find online, so. Yeah, and that'd be six years since we stocked them. So that's about three more years. Yep, yeah, I'll. I, I believe that link is on there, and I'll I'll update that link and put it put it back on there. So you don't have to do so much scrolling. Um, has ATV access during the ice season ever been considered at Crescent? Um, yeah, it has, and we decided not to do it because our agreement with the Mormon Church was for no ATV uh, down the it, down the trail to Blue Lake or on Blue Lake because they were sued in a case out in Utah, and if we let them on Crescent with an ATV, it's just a half mile jump over the hill to Blue, and we know darn well someone would do it. So no, we have not considered it at all for Crescent. All right. 
Um, are there any plans for improvements at Fry Lake for uh, boat access or anything like that that you guys see on the horizon? Well, we don't have a, a plan for it right now. Our lake is at exceptionally high levels. Um, I've seen it at six, seven foot lower than this. So um, maybe if it goes down, we'd take a look at some access. We do have some access projects we'd like to, to get in, but we're kind of at a high lake level right now to do anything. All right, does anybody else have any questions? That was our last one from the chat. Um, if not, uh, if you guys think of anything else that you'd like addressed, uh, Joe, Zach, and Al all have uh, had their contact info up there. This uh, presentation will also be uploaded to our YouTube page. Uh, so you can get their contact info from there. Otherwise, I will uh, turn it back over to Tony. Thanks, Jordan, and thanks, thanks everybody for for tuning in tonight. And once again, uh, you know we we pride ourselves on being available to the public and our anglers. So. Um, touching base with the guys in the Northwest district, touching base with, uh, with our other districts and, and people at headquarters. Um, we're more than willing to help out with information when you're planning your trip and, and going out and looking for, uh, looking for a good, good fishing, fishing outing. So um, really appreciate the feedback. It's really helpful for us as, as fish managers, um, knowing, you know, what, what kind of questions and comments you have as we, as, as you guys help guide the management for our fisheries in our state. So um, just, just really like to thank the, thank everyone for the participation tonight. It was really good. I'd also uh, echo those as Dean Rosenthal and Fisheries Division Administrator. I also want to thank uh, Commissioner Zingula for being online with us tonight. And uh, he's always available to the constituents out there. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, we've got a great bunch of commissioners right now and, and uh, they do a really great job. Uh, really appreciate all the work the guys do. Uh, thanks to Pat Molini for pitching in there. Uh, really appreciate the cooperation between divisions and uh, wanna thank everybody for getting on tonight and being a part of it and uh, really appreciate all the work the guys do in the field. Have a good evening, thanks. <laughs>